Well, hello, hello, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, and many song. Hello, DJ, author, and professional multiverse wizard specializing in world building and waifus mailing. Now, floating by my show, there is Grammarly, a succubus who's always open to game or acolytes. But the milking session is for after the stream, because right now, it's time for some fucking studying. Oh boy, studying, hello, Pansu. Yeah. Fun times! <laughs> Happy fun times! I love studying! <laughs> yeah! Oh shit, I forgot. Uh, where where did we stop actually? I need to check last stream. Second. I need to check where did we stop last time. I need to check where did we stop last time. <sighs> Because I forgot the I, I I forgot to mark the page number. There we go. Nope, that's not here. Oh God. Thirty-seven. About there. Forgot to check. Thirty-eight. 38 of, no, 40 something out of uh, 400 pages, so yeah. One more. Let's see. 37? No, was it 37? 62. But because the the page here, on the, on the picture itself and the page here on the Yep, and yeah, there's a difference. 62 of 497 pages on the PDF. Oh, like it's 37 out of 400 or something. 420 something pages. About of, uh, out of, uh, out of, uh, out of actual book stuff. Anyway. Uh, let me check. Should I, there's... Hmm, people aren't playing anything interesting today. I usually have like a second stream. I usually have a second stream on the side. Like a lurking, just watching while I read so it uh, distracts me. But nobody's playing anything that I want to watch today. Nobody's playing anything that I want to watch today. God damn it. This is, this is the true horror. This is the true... Oh, wait. Okay, okay. Playing Artonetico. Let's see. Okay, I'm just gonna watch some RPG or something while I read. Also, I need my notes on. I need my notes on, even though... It's gonna be difficult to make notes of. There's games I really, really, really want to play, but I have to wait. Yeah, same. I wanna... I have the itch to play Helldivers. I have the, so much itch to play Helldivers, but I have other games on the list and I need to make up... I need to schedule things with people. And I have to wait until schedule playing with... Oh, I guess I can play a few matches with randoms, but it's not the same thing. Not the same thing as playing with the people you have fun with. It's so annoying. So sad. So sad. <sighs> yeah. And of course, I also need to do these goddamn study streams because I made it a commitment to myself. So, I gotta keep... I gotta keep doing it! Studying it! Okay, now let me zoom this. Must study. Ooh, this zoom is horrible. 170? No, more. Ah, where's the zoom? 180 190 Wait, okay, where about 200 then? Oh, 200 was fine actually About 220 220, that sounds good enough So we can read the text And not strain my, my precious little eyes, which are already strained quite often also, the music's a bit loud. Let me turn it down just a tiny little bit. I think it's fine. Okay, okay, okay. Let's actually stop, uh, stop stalling and start this shit. 
Control under these circumstances, where local representatives of the state disposed of revenues in kind on the spot in exchange for exp expenditure in kind, was undoubtedly most difficult. Okay, well, what, was that? what were they even talking about here? Local representatives of the state disposed of revenues in kind in exchange for expenditure in kind. I guess they're doing trade, they must have been bribed or something. The fact that a pers private person had the right to collect public incomes, which resembled private incomes in every respect, led to a confusion of both, and eventually matters arrived at a point where the duty of performing some service in exchange for income of legally public character gradually disappeared. Mm. Point where the duty of performing some servant in exchange for income of a legally a public character gradually disappear. In other words, in practice, public revenues pass into private hands. Okay, so yeah, the people, the tax collectors, actually swindle all the money, stole all the public money to themselves because they were literally collecting the money. The tax collector were literally collecting the money and saying, yeah, you paid everything, this is how much you do and you paid it, and there was not enough, good enough, uh, how do you call it? What's the, what's the another word for treasury administration? Let me open this here. And browser window capture. There we go, I think this one is being, uh, yep guest accounting accounting that's the word that i want to look for accounting there is not enough good enough accounting for tax collecting Acquired this transference to private individual obligations to the state went maybe gone from this instant there was in germany in the middle ages a ceded privilege the non impignorando or the non alienado ab imperio consisting in security for its owner against the sale hire or pledging of one's obligations to the state. Right? And as late as the beginning of the 17th century, Charles Knight of Swindon granted this favor to Dutch immigrants, word found Luteborg, because they considered it necessary, although the request for it in a country like Sweden was pointless. Ah. Oh, okay, so there are, this, this law, the Imperial, was basically uh, being exempt from taxes and other, you know, other obligations towards, uh, towards, the, towards the state, whatever they may be. Taxes and other laws, I guess. Under the prevailing conditions of natural economy, the central authority could not govern from a capital. In fact, capitals could not really exist at all, for there was not enough income in kind for the maintenance of the court at any single place. Instead, the prince and his court were obliged constantly to travel about the country in order to utilize whatever had accumulated at various places. The constant traveling also served the purpose of keeping local rulers under observation, but there is no doubt that ruling under these circumstances was not to the likelihood of them. This is something I've never heard before. This is something I never heard before. Prince and his court were obliged to constantly travel about the country. Did princes and courts travel about the country? Out there, there we go. Internet court. Oh. An internet court was. A migratory form of government sharing European kingdoms during early during the early Middle Ages. It was an alternative to having a capital city, a permanent political center governed by a kingdom. Medieval Western Europe. Is it showing on screen? Yes, it's showing on screen. Was generally characterized by a political rule wherein the highest political authorities frequently changed their location, bringing parts of the country sort of government on their journey. Journey. Therefore, the realm had no actual center or permanent seat of government. Italian courts were gradually replaced from the 13th century, when stationary royal residents began to develop into modern capital cities. Ah, interesting. Hmm. Holy Roman Empire, okay. 
Yeah, I guess this, uh, the Holy Roman Empire is the time of the mercantilism, so I guess it makes sense. I guess it's related to the, to the book, really. German history. Usually long time. Mm -hmm. Holy Roman Emperors did not rule from any permanent central residence during or after the Middle Ages. They constantly traveled with their family and court through the Empire. The reason was certainly that, unlike in England and France, there was no hereditary monarch in the Holy Roman Empire, but rather the electoral principle, which led the kings of every of very different regional origins be elected in imperial elections. Does make sense, does make sense. Holy Roman Empire did not have a capital city. The emperors owned their varying they varying dynastic lands in Kundi castles, but could not limit themselves to these if they wanted to keep control of their large empire, including its often rebellious regional princes. Therefore, the emperor and other princes ruled by constantly changing their residence. Merovingian kings of the Frankish Empire they practiced this system, and a subsequent Carolingian dynasty adopted both the constant and its associate palaces. Uh, I mean, Spanish of Aiken. So they had various palaces. <laughs> locations, locations, I know. What be sh what's what's the fur urge? Oh, okay. Hmm. This is a... Uh... Uh, this is something you never really hear about. A migrating form of political power was an inherent feature of the feudalism that succeeded the more centralized Roman Empire. In Eastern Europe, Constantinople remained the characteristics of a political capital city, much more to any, than any Western city. Traveling government enabled better surveillance of the realm. The king's nomadic lifestyle also facilitated control over local magnates. Strengthening the national cohesion. Medieval government was, for a long time, a system of personal relationships rather than an administration of geographic areas. Therefore, the ruler had to personally deal with his subordinates. During medieval times, this oral culture gradually gave way to a documentary type of rule, one based on written communication, which generated archives making statue and rule increasingly more attractive to kings. Initially, rulers also needed to travel to meet court's financial needs. The inadequate transportation facilities simply did not allow a large group of people to stay permanently in one place. Instead of sending resources to the government, the government wandered to the resources. Food supplies and other necessities were usually transferred to the place where the court resided for the moment. In many countries, the traveling kingship persisted throughout the 16th century or even longer. Consequently, these pure economic benefits must have been less decisive than the political importance of traveling. The transition from a state with an itinerant court to a state ruled from a capital city was a reflection of how an oral way of life, wherein kings could win loyalty only by personally meeting their subjects face to face, gave way to a documentary, which the king employed a bureaucracy to communicate with his subjects. This is an interesting because you don't really see the sort of thing on on uh, popular media. You don't see you don't usually see the sort of thing on popular media. It's very very new to me. I think I heard a few times about something like this. But uh you know in traveling court without a capital, but most of the time there's always the capital city with a with a with a big castle, the seat of power and things like that. So and this is supposedly quite uh, important for, for medieval history. I guess, no, I guess in the feudal system it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as popular because people are just still on their own little clusters. But when things started to become more or more organized that, uh, that uh, the itinerant court search for a while. Hold up, my mic has a, my mic's twisting a little. Let me untwist it. Okay, 
Okay, for some reason the cable of my mic was twisting. Now, what about here? This is not a big Wikipedia page though. Oh. Hmm, England was very different in this respect. Center political power, permanently established in London. The financial center had been firmly established many centuries later. Ah. London became as near to an economic capital as the conditions of the age allowed. And prosperity and extensive liberties forbade it as a desirable place of residence for the king and his court, preventing it from becoming a political capital. Hmm. According to the system, the man and to govern their city, the only way to avoid conflict between the households and municipal jurisdictions was for the king to keep away from the latter much of the time. He could only be in the city as a guest or a conqueror. Accordingly, he seldom ventured within the city walls. On such occasions, he established himself either in the Tower Fortress or at his palace of Westminster. Where is Westminster? Where the fuck is Westminster here? There's supposed to be a... a... Oh, there it is. There's supposed to be a pin over here, but uh, Wikipedia did not show it for some reason. Just outside London. This was once outside London. This was considered once outside London. Now it's in the middle of the fucking massive mess. Centuries before monarchs out of there. Wait, why do you not? Uh, want the... He was attracted by the city's great wealth, but he was hesitant about taking up residence there. During his reign, London became as near to an economic capital as the conditions of the age allowed, but its very prosperity and extensive liberties forbade it as a desirable place of residence for the king and his court, preventing him from becoming a capital, a political capital. The king often wished to be near the great city, but he claimed the same power to control the court that the citizens demanded to govern the city. What does we study today? Same as the last three, mercantilism. I'm just taking a I'm just taking a tangent over here because I learned about Italian court, where the where the government system just travels across the country. And I'm reading about London. The king often wished to visit to be near the great city, but he claimed the same power to control the court that the citizens, citizens demanded to govern their city. The only way to, to avoid conflict between the household and the municipal jurisdictions was for the king to keep away from the latter much of the time. Ah, this is interesting. London was too powerful to handle. Century before monarchs settled there. Tried and successfully to drive the London merchants out of business by making Westminster a rival economic center. They tried to find some other suitable place in the kingdom to deposit their archives, which were gradually going too large and heavy to be transported on their unending journeys. York tended towards becoming a political capital during times of war with Scotland. And the reassurance against France caused the political center of gravity to shift to the southern parts of England, where London was dominant. Gradually, Many state institutions ceased to follow the king on his journeys and established themselves permanently in London. The treasury, the parliament and the court, the king himself was nice to take a permanent residence in London. It was possible for him to make London his capital after he had become powerful enough to ding the financial metropolis and transform it into an obedient tool of state's authority. Hello Christie, thank you for the lurk, please talk me harder. Though the country's political center tends to naturally emerge at the same place as the economics, country's economic center, the English historical example shows that this is not always the case. Centralizing and centrifugal forces counteracted each other, while wealth was both an attractive and repellent for some rulers. Huh. I wish there were more about this. I wish there were more about this. More and more articles about this. Uh, late 300. Mm. Yeah, because it's pretty common in... Uh, it's pretty common in all fantasies that the political center and the economical center are all, are all the same thing. Like, uh, 
The king lives on the most on the richest city of the country, but this is not exactly true. Like if you if you look over here in Brazil, we have our central government in the middle of the country, basically in the middle of fucking nowhere. While you have São Paulo and Rio de Janeiro as the two big economical centers, so well it is modern times, so this is more 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 possible over here. But still. Or the same as US, where like New York is the more famous one, where Washington is where the where the government lives. But it's modern times, so it is more possible. But in uh, medieval times, in fantasy, both having both both the political and economical center be the same place is super common. And I wish it wasn't. It is an op it's a nice depth of uh, it is a nice depth. Of uh, it's a nice depth of world building that it adds. <sighs> Let's see. Oh my world! Oh my world! Did I do this? I think I did this. I made I made the political I made the political and economic center the same as basically everywhere. Hmm. There are some like small exceptions, but not exactly significant or very. Or very prominent, like very, very important for the story, really. Emperor Charles V made 40 journeys during his lifetime, traveling from country to country in no single fixed capital city. It is estimated that he spent a quarter of his reign on the road. Damn. Charles V left a documentary trail nearly everywhere he went, allowing his story to surmise that he spent nearly half his life in the Low Countries and amounts of one third in Spain. Then more than 3,000 days. For 260 days, his exact location is unrecorded, all of them being spent at sea traveling between his dominions. Hmm, this is an interesting, this is an interesting tangent. Unfortunately, Fortunately, as you can see, this book, while boring as fuck, is also useful because I just learned something. I just learned something. Atos could not really exist at all, for there is not enough calm. Then the prince and his court branch travel about the country and to constant traveling through Okay, this is a bit of an interesting quote. You can just put on itinerant courts. On my notes, I'm gonna put itinerant courts as a as a note, and then I could also show this this screen, but I kind of don't want to. And I don't want to show this screen. Maybe for next stream, I'll put this. I'll put the notes on screen. Next, next stream. Yeah, maybe next stream I'll put the. I'll put my note file on on stream. Right now, I'm too busy to do this. Take notes, indeed. Take notes, pencil. Those will go on the test. Not yours, my own test. It should, however. By no means be imagined that natural economy and poor transport facilities land of necessity to this integration of the state. Sweden happens to be a striking example to the country. For Gustavus Vaza succeeded in building up a state with an unusually strong central authority on the foundation of a natural economy, which owed, the, which owed its existence not only to the governing forces of circumstances, but also to his conscious intention. Transport conditions do not provide the explanation in this case for Sweden at that time apparently had none worth boasting about. What can be said is that these factors in general only aggravate the difficulty of holding a kingdom together. Oh shit, come on. Don't allow me to do this fucking... Rolling, please. Securely, and in the majority of cases, the obstacles gained the upper hand. To what extent the Carolingian Empire formed an exception depends on the question. Though difficult to decide, 
of how far of how far it preserved the money economy and other features of the economic system of the ancients. Later in the Middle Ages, it was chiefly countries which were not too large and which were provided with exceptionally good communications, such as Burgundy, Aragon, and England. Where is Aragon? Where is Aragon? Where's my Aragon country? Oh, it's on Spain. Aragon is an autonomous community in Spain. Oh. How many autonomous communities there are of Spain? Is there like states? Catalonia, Aragon, Navarre, La Rioja, Basque, Galicia, Castile and Leon, Community of Madrid. La Mancha, huh. Andalusia, Andorra. Oh, this is Andorra. Officially, Principality of Andorra is a foreign landlocked country of in the Iberian Peninsula. Holy shit, I never knew this. On oh, no, yes, I knew this existed, but I kind of forgot it, it did exist. How cute. Okay, enough, enough tangents, enough tangents. Fuck. Yeah, uh, I'm too. I'm, I I like reading maps too much. I like just opening up maps and going into random, random, uh, random Wikipedia pages and seeing the history of places. Also, I need more socks. Hang on. I need more socks, and also I need to change these headphones. They're too stuffy today. They're too stuffy today. I'm just gonna. Switch up to my earphones, I guess. There's no need for, for this. One second. Aragon and England that escaped disruption. In France, the growing royal power was fortunate, eventually and gradually become master in the land. But in Germany, disintegration had gone so far that the original unity could not be reestablished when, towards the end of the Middle Ages, natural economy was superseded and salarified and, and a salaried officialdom created. Salaried officialdom? What? Instead, thousand territorial states had grown up on the ruins as social entities of smaller magnitude. From the point of view of our argument, it appears appropriate to consider the disintegration of the power of the state, which came about in this way as a twofold phenomenon. One, oh, the, the disruption uh, we read about in the disintegration that. Let me actually kind of remember what was disintegration talking about? I guess the, the unity of uh, identity. The individual identity of people, like when the feudal system, the the, the regions were all too, not too little. The regions were too different from each other. They're all too independent. So it was kind of it was kind of difficult to keep a, a unified identity of a state with all these different regions that were so culturally different from each other so there are sort of a disintegration where where the states that that existed could not hold the regions together so they started to break up into the famous little roman empire where there's a bunch of uh, different uh, little kingdoms and the holy Ro and the holy roman emperor was uh, having trouble keeping them all together because they're also too rebellious and independent, and they will not want to work together. I think that's what he meant by disintegration of the system. Point of your argument, it appears appropriate to consider the disintegration of the power of the state, which came about in this way as a twofold phenomenon. I think he's going to explain more about it. The one aspect of this eruption, which is fairly thoroughly explained by what has been said, consisted in the transferring of the power of the state to spiritual and temporal vessels. What? 
It led to the independence of large and small territories, which were indifferent as to whether the authority was legally grounded or ceded state powers, whether it was, legally speaking, usurpation. Oh yeah, because uh, because of these changes, because of these states were all changing, these, these small little regions were all changing kings, changing hands all the time, they did not care who governed them. They stopped caring who governed them, and that makes it hard to create a unified uh, national identity when the when the people don't care about it anymore a distinction of rather small moment from economic point of view in the economic sphere the result of this tendency oh hang up result of this tendency was essentially negative the enrichment of the lords tyranny and lawlessness without any positive economic policy worth mentioning if the people people did not care who ruled over them they would just give a, they would just obey the local lord that came about and took them legally or not and they could not care about uh, helping the 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 overall king or emperor and keeping the territory together without any positive economic policy worth mentioning yeah it was just the Lord having his having having his fun while uh, it really did not improve the economy, the situation for anyone else in any significant way. In the disintegration of the custom system, the coinage system, and the system of weights and measures to be dealt with in the two following chapters, the numerical measures were not, in the majority of cases. Part of a system with positive and economic and political aims. They had as their sole object merely the production of the largest possible yield for the possessors. The respective powers in these fields. Oh, okay, so. Customs? What did he say? Isn't it with the customs? They had so. Oh, this is a big quote. Fuck, I ended up. In the panel. But this is an interesting one because I think that uh, I think that the only thing was money, not uh Possessors of these respective okay. The disintegration of the custom systems, which regarded to goods, import and export of goods, I think. The coinage system, the money system. And the weighting system, so you can uh, you have you could have more um, weights and measures is good, so you can have more 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 trade, more how do you call it, standardized trade without a system of weights and measures. It's all a, it's all a bartering, and bartering is not the most efficient system. Bartering is not the most efficient system with weights, coins, and customs. There's a lot more. It's a lot more standardized and more more calculable and more materialized with bartering with all this system things become a little bit more um, a little bit more dangerous for the merchants because you can't exactly predict the costs you're gonna take and the profits you're gonna make it's a lot harder to predict without these systems the innumerable measures were not in the majority of cases part of a system with positive economic and political aims yeah so the people who were in power that were about that had to maintain these systems or actually create new measures, create new economic measures, they did not mean to they did not make these measures with the intent of helping the economy. The only they had the only objective was to production of the largest possible yield, profit for themselves. They only they only put these measures as a way to drain the population of money. You only put more laws, more economic laws, rules as a way to make more money. That was the that is a that is a common point in all of uh, in all of the mercantilism from what I've read. It's all about just money, 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 money. Go to have more money. Literally hoarding money. That's the sole point of this shit. However. Devastating an effect this had on trade and other peaceful activities, the 
It cannot be taken to be an economic system competing against the power of the state, but merely anarchy built upon the disintegration of the state. So the expression feudal is very ambiguous and easily misunderstood, yet I venture to define this aspect of disintegration as feudal, without implying more by this word than follows from what has been just stated. I think he meant that it's a uh, feudal, it is, it does, does the sort of anarchy consider feudal because it's about, uh, it's all about the, the rules of the locals. The rules of the locals is a very thing, is a very thing of a, uh, each local region having their own special rules and laws and everything else was very quote unquote feudal. So that's why he mentions it as being, this anarchy as being feudal. Side by side with this kind of aimless plundering, However, there existed a far more serious form of disintegration base, as it was, on ideas and consciously or inconsistently striving to direct economic life along a def definite line. Economic policy thus de created did produce a competing system in conflict with the power of the state. The policy referred to is that of the towns and it follows from what has been said that it cannot be explained by merely negative influence natural economy and poor means of intercommunication it must have had its basis far more in the rise of those new social structures the growing towns which represented almost everything that was really new in the economic life of the early middle ages that the new economic policy originated in these active new social structures was only to be expected and in fact the policy of the towns in the middle ages was probably the first attempt in western europe after the decline of the ancient world to regulate society on its economic side according to consistent principles. The attempt was crowned with unusual success, for we should have to search long in the period before and after, before finding anything comparable with the policy of the towns in its consistent pursuit of a definitive object. Economic liberalism, or laissez-faire, the time of its unchallenged supremacy is perhaps such an instance, but in regard to duration, Liberalism was a small, evanescent episode in comparison with the persistent tenacity of the policy of the town. Okay, so the policy of the towns, the rise of the towns. He's talking about the importance of the towns as economic centers, and I think they were like, oh, they're completely lawless and wild, like a, like a wild west of, uh, of trade, the towns were. But he's also, I think he's also mentioning that it's a, the town, the, the lawless and the liberalism and all the, and all the confusion and, and craziness going on in the towns, they're not just, uh, they're not just based on greed, but also as a, as a, as a complex system that was actually the best system that people could think of at the time. It cannot be explained by merely negative influence. Yeah, he has a very annoying way to speak ah, this book is so thick and not in a good way important means of intercommunication what is natural economy did he mention this before natural economy Hitchcock said the contention that there was a gap in the cultural development directly before the time of the current legion and then the significant beginning of the medieval natural economy and the period of feudalism i had that beef so thick yeah that book so thick that it fucking kills my mind natural economy come on the natural economy natural economy Natural economy. Natural economy. Searching, searching, searching. Nope. What the fuck is natural economy? Natural economy. Come on, English, please. Fuck's sake. Natural economy is a type of economy in which money is not used in the transfer of resources among people. Oh, it's bartering. A system of allocating resources through direct bartering, entitled by law or sharing out according to traditional custom. 
In the more complex forms of natural economy, so go some goods may act as a referent for fair bartering. But generally, currency plays only a small role in allocating resources. Corollary The majority of goods produced in a system of natural economy are not produced for the purpose of exchanging them, but for direct consumption by the producer. Subsistence As such, natural economies tend to be self contained where all the goods consumed are produced domestically. Mm -hmm. Where were we? Active new structure was only expressed patently. Fan policy of towns was probably the first attempt to decline to regulate society as an economic side according to consistent principle. Yeah, they tried to homogenize economy. In the negatives such as natural economy and permeates into communication. Okay, big thick paragraph that doesn't speak anything meaningful. The growth of the power of the towns was thus, on the whole, synonymous with the decline of the power of the state. And from the time of the Crusades onwards, when a money economy once again grew up, it was the towns, rather than the territorial states which profited by it, especially where the power of the state was already in decline. You're streaming so early! Yeah, this is streaming for you, you trying friendly. Hello, Bankum. Lovely to have you here. Spin hard! Spin, watch it. Look at him go spin. Look at him go spin. Yeah, I want, uh, I want to study early because studying this book at night would be the death of me. I want to stream early because this sort of things, they need to be done like in my Zyphonero now. Okay, hat is off. No protection, we going raw. Watch out everyone, the nerd has his hat off. Uh, doing this sort of streams at night is gonna kill me. It's much better, it's much easier for me to do them uh, on the afternoon right now. I think I'm doing. So that at night I can, uh, I can uh, do a little bit of uh, relaxing. Thank you, Bankan, for head patting chat. Everyone, Bankan, show his appreciation to you. Let him go, the good boy. Anyway. Ah. <sighs> Where were we? Oh, break time soon. Five minutes until break time, I guess. Eight minutes. Read at night and fall asleep on stream. <laughs> I actually not gonna fall asleep. I'm gonna fucking die. That's what. I'm gonna fucking die. On stream if I stream at night. Christ. Anyway. When a money economy once again grew up. It was the towns, rather than the territorial states which profited by it. Especially where the power of the state was already in decline. In northern Italy, the Eldorado of independent towns, the result was often an absolutely sovereign city. Venice, for example, a città dominante, the ruling city, whose character was outspoken, consistent, municipal egoism survived the French Revolution and was only broken down by Napoleon. In other cases, Territorial states certainly arose in Italy, but developed around the most powerful city as their center, as for example, in Milan and Florence, Tuscany. Hmm. Yeah, we think rising importance of money as, uh, as the feudal societies start to become interconnected and they start to replace their their bartering economies for money and rising importance of money and profit. Cities, which are the economic, which have a thing about being uh, some uh, some places where people gather to trade and make profit. Yes, that's the thing. Cities are places where people gather to trade and make money. So you, if money starts to become important, then cities start to become powerful. And uh, free trade starts to become ultra important for this power. Which means that the, that the, that the rulers also look, lose power. Kings and lords also lose power because they are not the economy. They're just the good. They're just the people with the soldiers. They're just people who have a who have a monopoly on violence. But if violence is not the sole way to acquire power, the cities become powerful themselves, especially because they also gain uh, they also gain uh, the ability to hire mercenaries. Thank you, Mimi, for the headpats. Right on my ear. 
right on my left ear. I appreciate that. I'm I mean I'm in the need of a I mean I'm always in the need of patting for energy. Especially on the stream. Especially on this painful stream. So yes, we are, I needed I needed to add more on my on my stories. On my stories the the worlds are too centralized. They're too centralized. I need to add more economic centers or things like that. I need to add more economic centers. Well, it kind of makes sense. At least in Rupedia, the center of the world is basically the imperial capital because the emperor specifically orders for for goods to be brought to the capital for trade. So, like the the capital is uh, located in a rather central area of the world. And the policy is that uh, goods should always be flowing into the capital. So it makes sense that it is the uh, com commercial center of the world because of, uh, of these policies. He encourages trade in the capital. While uh, other, other lords, they are more territorial, they are more controlled, they are more authoritarian over trade and things like that. So while in the capital, so while in the imperial capital, things are more liberal. The other kingdoms inside the empire, the empire, the empire is made of multiple kingdoms. The empire on my on my story is made up of multiple kingdoms, and these kingdoms have a lot of autonomy. And the kings, the rulers of these kingdoms, they these territories, they are very protectionist over their goods because they want to keep this autonomy. Over culture and goods. So with uh, with having hold of the so with uh, with having control of the autonomy of the of the flow of certain goods, they can keep a high amount of money for themselves, which means that they also can keep power. So it does make sense. It does make sense in a way that my world work that my world. Is like that where the kings control the economy in the there's not many there's not many city-states independent city-states economic centers like Venice and other in other places but but it would be nice if I made them to be honest in the other con I guess it's fair I guess it's fair there's like three different continents and each continent has their own like more of a of their own flair. The main continent where the Empire is located is more traditional with its authoritarian system. There is the the, the other continent is a bit a bit more broken up. There's no empire in that second in that secondary continent. So they are small little kingdoms. And they also fight a lot over economic economic powers. So while the while the it's a bit complicated that second continent, so it's not it's not really interesting to go into the details of it. But in the second continent, there are more city quote unquote city states, things like city states. But on the third continent, it's the one that I have developed the least. I could add more city states, honestly. I should add city states to the third continent. Because it's even more, it's even more wild of a continent. It's basically, it's basically constant war over there. It's a pretty rough place. Yeah, yeah, it made sense. I need to add to my notes, honestly. Let me just quick make a, go back to my files of my stories. I need to add this as notes. Because it's important. Let's see. Where is it? I gotta download it over here because I keep my files on the cloud. It's for reasons like this that I'm studying this. To improve the world building of my story, so... If I have a note... If I have something interesting to add, I should. I should take time to add. Now, ads are coming in 1 minute and 20 seconds. So we'll do a quick break soon.
There we go. Now I just gotta upload it. I keep all my files on the cloud, like a... Just as a backup in case I lose them. Because I do switch a lot between my computer and my... And my laptop. So... It is the easiest way to use Google Drive as a as a source control universe. Keeping them uh keeping things up to date. I can open up the file anywhere I want. Anyway, where were we? Milan and Florence Tuscany. No. Germany had nothing comparable. And the difference is due to the fact that in very few instances the German territorial states develop out of independent cities or around them. Mm. They were, on the contrary, a form of organization rivaling the towns and eventually politically superior to them. Most German cities were obliged to submit to territorial authority. Even the free imperial cities, which were directly and solely under the emperor, never retained a political power compared with that of the Italian cities. Oh. To this extent, the breakup of the central power in Germany was due less to the cities than to the territorial states. However, this is a purely external political aspect. On the economic side, territorial power in Germany too was of fleeting significance in comparison with the consistent policy of the towns. Hmm. In France, the king and the towns were, to some extent, in alliance against the big vassal. But there too, economic policy was essentially the work of the towns. The country in which towns matters least was probably England, and if foreign merchants enjoyed their unusually expensive privileges, it was not an expression of the weakness of the royal power, but on the contrary, of its capacity to express itself in the face of the commercial, commercial enviousness and the exclusiveness of the na native burgers. 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 I need to search what those words mean. Even there, however, the economic policy of the towns exerted a determining influence for a considerable period. Okay, it's time for a 3 minutes ad break, see you guys soon. I'm gonna stretch a little bit and walk.
All right, quick break is over. Add my stretch. Do I have a? Let me see one thing. I need to check my hotkeys. I need to check my hotkeys. Switch. Do I have a hotkey for the scene? I do not have a hotkey for the reading stream. For the reading scene on OBS. I need to make one. I already have too many hotkeys. Starting to forget them. Anyway, burgers. Naughty, naughty, tasty burger. Burger, social class. A burger was a rank or title of privileged citizen of medieval towns in early modern Europe. Burgers formed the pool from which, which city officials could be drawn and their immediate families that formed the social class of the medieval burgeons. Burgeons, burgeons. Bourgeoisie. Oh shit, I don't have the <laughs> I don't have the, uh, the headphones on. Hang on. I'm not listening to the Bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie. What? Yeah. Is this how you actually say this in English? Bourgeoisie? Oh my god, my life is a lie. My life is a lie. I thought you pronounced it bourgeoisie. Burgundy. No, no, I'm, I'm mixing up with the pronoun with the Portuguese pronunciation. Oh well. Into into the burgers. Burger. 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 It really is burger. Okay. We going hard. <laughs> burger. Burger. Okay. Burger. Burger. Wait, wait. Social class. Entering to the burger status, varied from country to country and city to city. Therefore, ownership of property in a town was conditioned for acceptance as a burger. Maybe you needed some cows too. It was taken as a crime against the city community. Burger was assassinated, the other burgers had the right to bring the supposed murder to trial by judicial combat. Trial by judicial combat. You by combat. Oh my god, it actually was a thing. In the Netherlands, burgers were often exempt from corvée or forced labor. Privilege which later extended to the Dutch East Indies. Only burgers could join the city guard in Amsterdam because in order to join, guardsmen had to purchase, purchase their own equipment. Membership in the guard was often a stepping stone to political positions. Oh. Grand Burger <laughs> Porter Bourgeois Yeah, Bourgeois is what uh, oh, I thought it was supposed to be pronounced by this Bourgeois Bourgeois Okay, okay, this is what I was thinking about. This is the word I was talking about. Bourgeoisie. Bourgeois. See, there's a difference. Bourgeois. Bourgeois. Bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie. Bourgeois. Anyway. Enough of this tangent. Even there, however, the economic policy of the town exerted a determining influence for a considerable period. There are also, in addition to these two principal tendencies, other disrupting forces more difficult than an adequate explanation. Wait, wait, wait. Burger, yeah. Hamburger. One more chances. Can I quote anything from this paragraph? No.
it's a grow up money economy yeah once uh, once when a money economy once again grew up it was a towns rather than territory states preferred to play this is an interesting this is an interesting quote because it's a resume it's a summary i say resume but the, it, because it's in portuguese it's res, resumo summary means resumo resumo in portuguese so i keep mixing up the words i do this a lot there was also in addition to these two principal tendencies other disrupting forces more difficult of adequate explanation resumen resumen how is it actually pronouncing uh, what is it actually pronouncing summary how is it pronounced in spanish Espanol. My God, I hate this. I hate this. The way the 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 the, the Google is like a. Resume. Resume. Where's Portuguese now? Resumo. Resume. Resume. Oh, there's also resume, which is the thing you write when you want a job, like the your your character sheet when you're doing a job, looking for a job. How funny things about language. Because I like etymology, so I like these sort of things. I'm easily distracted by these sort of things. Anyway. There are also, and in addition to these two principal tendencies, what is European forces more difficult of adequate explanation? They are perhaps soon as they are perhaps soon as comprehended if considered in those wise. Transport difficulties produce local differences, which, thanks to inertia and absence of rational thinking, persisted without any logical cause other than they already existed. Oh, this is an interesting quote. This is an interesting quote. Confusion in this system of weights and measures certainly owe this origin to such unintentional planless. Even though the feudal disintegrating forces were simultaneously at work, economic policy in the Middle Ages offers sufficient examples of conservative. Oh, okay. He's he's saying that. Uh, that the local, yeah, the local difference produced like a specialized, some, some very complex local laws. But even though the, even though the feudal disintegration of forces were working, like uh, the, the feudal, there was going, there was going like a, an integration of natural unity. There are still a lot of economic conservative policies that kept these complex these complex laws in place but even though there was there was a reason for them to change for things to to change and improve their conservative conservative thinking they have them in place conservatism but one of the best that i know is that the florentines retained for 85 years that is from 406 to 491 the tolls against their own textile industry, set up by Pisa before its incorporation in the Florentine state. I shall come across many other examples in later chapters. You know, these fears, the new states had awaiting them great problems in decisive importance for the development of economic life. For the state could be united, it was necessary to cleanse the Algian stables. The question was only whether it would be done successfully, according to tradition, in the Herculean manner, or whether it would prove a Sisyphean labor, an insoluble or at least a Herculeanly unsuccessful undertaking. Jesus Christ, the fucking phrasing of this is so thick. So pompous and difficult. Great process for the development of economic life. Before the states could be united, it was necessary to clinch be done successfully i think this is another interesting call not super not super special but good to have at 
first sight, it might appear that the task of the reorganized state was an easy one, at least so far as the haphazard flinging away of state rights and powers to any lord or local authority was concerned. It was something which in principle could hardly be defended from any point of view, and it might be assumed to fall to pieces at the lightless onslaught. <laughs> I can already see where this is going wrong. But in reality, circumstances were quite different. For there existed in the first place very strong interests deeply concerned that the power of the state should not be unified, and the state consequently had to overcome correspondingly powerful forces. Nor oh, was this all. Okay, let's, let's start the first part of this paragraph before I forget. Alphazard flinging away of state rights and powers to any lord or local authority. Yeah. Like, uh, like, uh, for example, being exempt from taxes. Like, uh, there are a lot of exemptions and, uh, and rules that give more, that give more freedoms to the lo lords and local authorities. And it was not done in a, in a logical or sensible way. So, so the local people will be, will be, so, so the logical conclusion was that the people will be more welcome to having these these powers, these weird random powers are given to the lords taken away, but there are going to be quite a lot of people who has interest in keep not only keeping these powers and helping the lords keep this power, but also in doing anything against the state. So long as the state could not rid itself of the social institutions which had created disruption, lack the authority necessary to overcome it. And from what follows, it will be seen that in many instances, instead of overcoming them, it sought far more to make a profit out of the existing disruption. <laughs> so yeah, instead of the state actually correcting these problems and dealing with the people, the only purpose of the people in power were to make money. So they they would find a way instead of instead of fixing the problems to make to make more money out of these problems. On the other hand, victory over feudal particularism, by reason of the absence of principle or plan, demanded a creative imagination in the agents of the state, a capacity to set up something positive where nothing before existed. Such imagination is altogether rare in the history of mankind, and was perhaps particularly so in the period under consideration. Okay, so not only were there people, people working against unification of the state under the central authority of the king and whatever but also there in many cases the, th the places were simply undeveloped because of feudalism because of feudal feudal particularism where they had as was said before the feudals the, the feuds had the uh, oral tradition they just simply had an oral tradition and nothing more everything was done on uh Everything was done through through voice and setting up a bureaucracy so you can keep laws and communications and things written that can be referred to. An archive of things that can be referred to would be quite a big task. Not only that, but there is also any other sort of infrastructure or culture that would help standardize trade and economy. To push away from the substance from the simple substance farming. That they were stuck on. You decided the problem. Wait, can I quote something from this? There exists a deep concern. <sighs> the common itself make for a problem. On the other hand, victory over. Okay, these are two quotes. That Principal plan. When the current a capacity to set up something. And nothing existed. Oh shit. These are. They existed. Powerful forces. These are two interesting quotes.
the other side of the problem, the transformation of the system of town policy into an economic order dictated by the interests of the state, requiring the agents of the state a far smaller measure of independent political imagination, since the old methods could simply be made to serve new purposes. But the danger here was that transferred institutions might simply preserve their old spirit under more or less apparent guise of purely external changes. Okay. So in the in the in the depth of the, the feudal system, there are two things that happen. Places that remained places that remained uh, stuck. Places that remained stuck on the mutable system without progress. And also the other towns that evolve and progress into liberalist utopias. Well, not exactly liberalist, but the but the but the cities re, uh, turn into metropolis, economic centers, where the liberal well the liberal liberal philosophy was uh, how do I say it central to it. But the rulers wanted to take control of it. The ruler wants to take control of the cities. And how could they? How could they actually take control of a city that did not want to obey? Like, nobody there wants to obey you. How do you actually take control of it? You also can't destroy the city. You can't, you can't exactly conquer a city that you want to rule over. You, need, you, you, don't, want to, you don't want to rule over ashes. If you do that, it loses its purpose. The city loses its purpose because it's an economic center. You want to grab the money that is there, not just... You want to grab the source of money that is there, control the source of money, not just steal it and ruin it forever. But if the people do not want to obey you, then how do you make them obey you? You can't use power, you can't use force. And the people that you send there are always ineffective. They just ignore whatever, they, they just want to do their own thing, so... How do you actually take control of, of these places? Because that's the... that's the... That's the that's the progression towards mercantilism. Where the central authority became a lot more stronger. And in control of the economy, the cent that's the... A central point of mercantilism. The central authority was in control of the economy, which means that you need to be in control of the cities, your economic centers. Or at least, not that you have, but that is the goal. That was the goal of the rulers of that time. That was the goal of the rulers of that time. Dictated by the institutes recurring engines and smaller. It consists of old metals. Yeah, this is a transformation of the system of Tao policy into an economic order dictated by the interests of the state. This will be a quote if it wasn't uh, in any other. This is a, well, it is a good summary. It's a good summary of a summary of mercantilism. Mercantilism. For the rulers. Mary of the goal of the goal of the rulers under mercantilism. I guess I can just write this on my notes. In order to understand clearly the reconstru reconstruction of the states after the dissolution in the Middle Ages, it is best to ask what might have happened at this Rina, is this a, an eye missing here? I think there is a word missing. It is not wrong. Wait. The revival? Okay. Renaissance. Another thing for Renaissance. I guess it's the actual word. Yeah, Renaissance is the the this the French way of saying, which became the the historical period, and this is the word it was based on. It is undoubtedly. Let me mark something. There we go. 
where were we? Renaissance, Renaissance, Re Renaissance, Renaissance. What was the word? I kind of forgot it. Ah. Absolute. Fuck. Oh, this Renaissance never occurred. It is undoubtedly a severe mental test to try to remold history in this fashion. But to form a conception of one part, one of many contributing factors played in historical development, it is necessary, in every such attempt, to make the tacit or explicit assumption that one or the other of these factors was absent, and then to ask what the result might have been. Wait, what? I read this and I absolutely... He went into one ear and out to the other. During the volume is necessary in whichever to make tacit or explicit assumptions that one or the other of these facts are the, the result might have been. Uh, uh, the reconstruction of the states after dissolution in the Middle Ages. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. This, in the Middle Ages, the state fell apart and then it was brought back. But what was different this time? What was different this time? The second time the state, the power of the state came back. The history of the Middle Ages certainly proves that people can live in much more restricted units of society, held together and tied to a larger cultural circle by means of one shiftly spiritual bond. Not only is such a life physically possible, but in it, human problems can be truly perceived, which in larger social structures must more or less necessarily be sacrificed. It is, it is really the confinement of medieval society which is the base for all the beautiful things said about it in recent times. Not only from the Catholic side, but also from the half ethical, half aesthetic point of view. Within, within its principal city in England, originated by Carlyle and Ruskin, written by William Morris, the disciple of the latter, and to be found also to a certain extent in the writings of the modern youth socialist. Alongside all the arcane and even barbarity of the times, people are conscious of what can be named serenity or dignity of human nature. Human dignity was protected and sheltered by the fact that one belonged to a corporation which guided its members through the whole of their lives and lift up its everyday activity, religious ideas and its other aspects of life into a higher unity. Therein lay a freedom from mechanization which had a special appeal for an altruistic artistic nature such as Morris. No later period can hold up to it. Anything equivalent, certainly not the one immediately following which considered the video merely as raw material on which the state was built. Uh, this is a bit of philosophical talk about the life of people and not very interesting. And not very interesting. Honestly. Because it's a bit... Eh? People were conscious of what can be named serenity or dignity of human nature. Just like, oh my god, I'm sorry, but this is something like a bit of pretentious bullshit to me. I am a bit of a technocrat, you could say. Not technocrat, but uh, enthusiast of technology and things like that. And uh, the sort of, the thing of this talk about uh, simple life, it does not really appeal to me. Talk about simple life, dignity, what? Serenity, what? Meh, meh, just gonna move on. It was serving no useful purpose trying to weight this positive aspect against other typical features of medieval society, which are just as much the result of local restrictedness, but which perhaps do not rouse such warm sentiment. The result could not but be a subjective. There is, however, a possibility of arriving at some sort of definite and objective results in answer to the question of what occurred in the economic sphere and what was impeded to the overcoming of particularism. Yeah, basically all this paragraph is, is, uh, is saying that it's possible to, change, to get some, uh, some objective ideas of, uh, of, uh, of what good happen after overcoming the 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 particularism which is the local 
is the lo the power of the locals overcoming the local culture that created like those mass of a that mass of a law system the specific to the local area it is true that economic life does not exhaust itself in quantitatively measurable things since it deals with the possibilities of satisfying human wants or wants are anything that men at different times consider them to be the difference between medieval and modern conditions lies to a large extent in the fact that wants and demand have altered their direction in other words it lies in a sphere that evades every attempt at quantitative measurement of purpose oh my god what are you talking about nevertheless the satisfaction of wants or if you will human life has certain natural necessary physiologically indispensable assumptions affecting subsist subsistence in the narrow sense and here it is possible to initiate quantitative comparison from this point of view the changes that have taken place as me expressed as follow thanks to economic development there are lives today a far larger population than has ever lived before it lives in a material sense food clothing and shelter in a far wealthier state than ever before and lastly there is a far greater differentiation of demands for the satisfaction of human wants than in any previous period that is there today satisfied by material means a host of wants altogether unknown in previous century okay this is an interesting one because it is a summary of the of the philosophical bullshit he was talking about this is a good summary mm. Good okay, one hour halfway through, halfway through this stream. Apart from the questioning of good or bad, however, all does had the overcoming of medieval particularism as its first postulate. The present economic system will be a pure impossibility at the time when goods and travelers were held up by customs barriers at about every six miles on the best of routes. Whoa! How many miles to kilometers? Six miles to kilometers. Ten kilometers. Apart from the question of good or bad, however, all this and the overcoming of medieval particles is for especially. The present economic system will be a pure impossibility at a time when goods and travelers were held up by customs barriers at about every six miles on the best of rounds. And as the governor of the Imperial Mint in Germany said, the currents change with every day's journey. When industrial activity was confined to the handy craftsmen of the locality, and agricultural production was subordinate to the interests of the neighboring little municipality, and every little community governed as it thought best. Holy shit, this is a, this is a big of a claim. Every 10 kilometers there was a toll. Every 10 kilometers there was a toll. This is insane. To think about. This is insane. The expansion of production was hampered even more by the particular attitude of mind insolubly bound up with particularism, whose ideal was a static one, firmly anchored in a religious system and believing in subsistence, according to rank. This is also interesting because yeah, you cannot expand, you cannot produce when every little place has their own super extremely specialized laws and rules to the point of insanity. It, it, it puts into context the level of insanity. At all, there was a custom barrier at every six mile, every 10 kilometer. There was a barrier because it was like a, a little town. And then another little town with their own rules, and another little town with their own rules. So, how do you make a, how do you make something industrial in capacity, in scale, something industrial scale, when when everything is so insanely different? And this particular uh, this particularism, this particular attitude of mine, was insoluble 
because it was bound it was anchored in a religious system and believing in a substance according to rank because of religion and because of their their ideas that uh, you did not need any more than that because of your rank this is also another interesting quote religion is also an in the way a technique which was certainly altered artistically high but unalterable in principle and in which economic activity was considered to be was considered to a very great extent as an end in itself it is difficult to say with any degree of precision how big a population might live under these conditions but to state that sweden within its present day boundaries could feed a single million instead of supporting its present population of six million is to put the figure too high rather than too low it necessarily remains to everybody to draw his own conclusions from this yeah he's saying that this the system could not feed could not feed the current population in any way shape or form because of how inefficient it was of a system but it affects themselves and their consequences are to be kept clearly in mind there is little doubt that the destruction of medieval particularism was one of the indispensable fundamental conditions for making life physically possible for the mass of people at the present time <sighs> okay i need to read this again with the facts themselves and their consequences are to be kept clearly in mind there is little doubt that the destruction of medieval particularism was one of the indispensable fundamental conditions for making life physically possible for the mass of people at the present time a smaller population living on the medieval con condition is preferable thereby neither proved nor refuted for that is a question of purely subjective evaluation oh okay yeah so he's also making making a, a cautious claim that even though the medieval system could not feed the population we have today that is not necessarily a bad thing that is not necessary especially in this modern time where you have a or you have people talking about overpopulation overpopulation and having too much and having not enough resources to produce enough to feed the material needs not exactly to feed just to satisfy the material needs of everyone that uh, a smaller population would actually be more 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 desirable for the world and the environment so yes it is a it is a It is an interesting quote. That's a good. Uh, it's a good cautious statement to make. And he's on ninety ninety four or something, something of that kind. The forty three. Where was this book made? Where was this book made? London, New York. Nineteen thirty one. 1931 before the first world war no yeah before the first world the second world war and he had still does and he had and he had them he had made a statement that uh, that was true now true to modern times this is the power of being cautious yeah let me Time to breathe less. <laughs> oh no. Oh no, the unintended consequences. We need to breathe less. Fuck. No. No, I do not accept this. I do not accept this. The world. The world. Everyone must be bred. Everyone must breed. Everyone must breed. Everyone must be bred. Millions must breed. 
I am now I am now a uh, population maximalist. I am a population maximalist now. We will find a way to live with a massively large population. Let me type something over here. One second. I'll continue in a moment. All right. Now, let's continue. In the following chapters, I shall first deal with policy in the sphere of field of disintegration in the narrow sense, that is, simply with the circumstances of disruption, without considering its special economic import. Then go on to the attempts made to nationalize the consciously designed and firmly coordinate policy of the towns. The fact that field of disruption was so inorganic in character and makes the treatment of the work of American studies unification comparatively easy decided to illustrate this work in detail in only one sphere, namely that of the dolls and custom systems supplementing the facts where necessary in other spheres. The work of the town economy, on the other hand, is at the core of the economic policy of the period and demands a quite different and more exhaustive examination. Despite of this, I could not think of enumerating either here or at any other point all the fields in which similar efforts have repeated themselves. In connection with the treatment of the policy of the towns, there is a long chapter devoted to the field in which the newly created practice of mercantilism was most important, namely foreign trade and entrepreneur organization, the latter being the main trading companies and their counterparts in order in other spheres of activity. Lastly, the question of the success or failure of all these efforts will be discussed. This constitutes the first part of the present book. Now we actually, st I think that was, what was the name of the chapter again? Mercantilism as a unifying system. Yeah, that's pre pretty much the introductory chapter, I guess. We Yeah, chapter 2, that was basically an introductory chapter. There was already an introduction, then there's the introductory chapter. There's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of uh, slow introduction to this thick, heavy, and long topic, if you know what I mean. There needs to be a lot of gentle introduction to it, because it's going to be quite hard. Because it's quite hard. Now, chapter 2, the integration of this toll system and the efforts to overcome the confusion. Introduction. In the Middle Ages, the greatest obstacles to trade were the tolls. Is this how to pronounce it, actually? Nope, oh, wrong. Where's the translate? Toll. Toll. S. Oh, come on. Tolls. Oh, not dolls. Tolls. In the Middle Ages, the greatest obstacles. Wait, let me check the... Uh, okay. The music was not on loop, so it could end. And we'll be left with nothing. In the Middle Ages, the greatest obstacles to trade were the tolls. Tolls. The main reason for this was indicated in the previous chapter, namely that the tolls, more than any other measure of economic policy, 
affected the most valuable part of trade, that moving along the cheap rivers, which constituted the, almost the only long distance natural means of communication before the invention of the compass. Consequently, medieval trade was much more restricted and was warranted by purely technical difficulties. And as a result, the importance of the natural trade routes was rendered no greater or even less than that of the artificial ones, the unsatisfactory character of which depended on the existing state of technical logic. But in time, this obst obstructive policy was also applied to the artificial route. Okay, need to type something over here. One more second. There we go. Let's see. So, was the main reason for this? Was it okay? It talks. This is an interesting one. I'm gonna stitch together a big boat. But it talks affected the most value that moving along the rivers. Or the invention of the compass. Okay. Let's stitch together these two sentences. Because without uh, without uh, mean without uh, if, oh I did not actually the tones there it goes natural means of communication means of communication they disrupted the means of communications and communications is super important for a uh, for a uh, how do you say it for a uh, good government system you need you need open communications between the various parts of the country and if communication is hampered by tolls and uh, difficulties in money then yeah you're gonna have a different we're gonna have a lot of problem you're going to have a lot of problem uh managing administrating your territory i don't breathe anymore but i don't breathe any less <laughs> oh no we should always breathe We should always breathe, Pencil. Breathing, elect me, and I'll have breathing for everyone. Breathing for all. This is my this is my election motto. One day I'm gonna be elected king, king of the world. Natural trade walls were rendered no great to less and up with the feature ones, the unsatisfactory character of which depended on the existing state of technology. But in time, this obstructive policy was also applied to artificial routes, yeah. So tolls were on the rivers, the natural trade routes, and even after they made roads, the tolls were also applied to the roads, so... Hmm. 
It is evident that, before proceeding further, we must clearly distinguish between the general system of medieval tariffs and those of modern times. Ooh, this is an interesting. How does... <laughs> Look at this statement that I'm about to say. Medieval tariffs is an interesting topic. Medieval tariffs is an interesting topic. I have not... I don't think I've ever said... Uh... A more nerdier thing. I'm not actually even worried. Medieval tariff is an interesting topic. I don't think I've ever said something more nerdier than this. I don't think I've never said something nerdier than this now. In the Middle Ages, tariffs were not... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say. Because uh, if there is a difference between medieval tariffs and those of modern times, it's more things that you can add to your world building to make it feel more authentically medieval or something like that. Anyway. In the Middle Ages, tariffs were not... Am I even saying this right? I need to keep... I need to keep checking if the pronunciation of words is correct because my accent. Tariffs. 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 Tariffs, tariffs. In the Middle Ages, tariffs were not duties imposed at the boundary between two different political territories. Or far rather, charges leveled on internal trade along land and water routes, markets and towns. In time, tolls were leveled at interstate boundaries too, but this was a much later development. Hmm. Hmm. Interstate boundaries was not a common thing. I see, I see, I see. Charges leveled in internal trade. Huh. In Germany, caught up as it was into numerous small states and lacking any sense of geographical unity, even within the separate territories. This distinction was, moreover, not very significant, since political boundaries were met with at very short intervals. In general, the principle was simply to set up tolls at those points which trade could least easily avoid. They are thus concentrated at particular places or geographical points, in a manner wholly foreign to the modern custom system. The system consequently suffered from a co complete lack of guiding principle. In fact, it was this chaos which had become the system. We see that we are dealing here primarily with a feudal phenomenon. The first group of factors which determine the process of social disintegration, and only secondarily with a piece of conscious town policy, though the latter was not wholly insignificant. Yeah, uh, as again. We see that we are dealing primarily with a feudal phenomenon, the first group of factors which determine the process of social disintegration, and only secondarily with a piece of conscious policy. It was because the it was because there was a lack of unity because of the lack of there was a disintegration of society in the uh, in state that there that the tolls were not put into the geographical boundaries or political boundaries of the of the regions because there are no boundaries it was chaos and secondly, with a piece of conscious tone policy. It was because of the condition of the society, and only second because it was a, a secondary decision that it was, a, it was a something. Conscious effort into. Conscious effort. Conscious decision into where and how those tones operated. It was primarily because of the condition of the society at the time. Although the latter was not wholly insignificant. Of course, the general character of the times left its impress on terrorist measures just as on all other features of the period, as will be seen in the third part of this work, which deals with mercantilism as a protectionist system. But on the whole, tolls received this impress unconsciously. Their primary function, overshadowing all their other aspects, was to provide revenue for those who wielded them. To provide, yeah, that's the only basically theft. <laughs> this is the beginning of the taxation is theft. This is the beginning of the taxation is theft uh, meme because on medieval times it was basically stealing money. 
The whole purpose of the towns was just to steal money from the people. Not really anything else, just more money for me. More money for me. More money for the person in power. These days, these days, taxes are used to fund the government and other social projects. Like say, pay the police, pay the pay the hospitals, pay the healthcare that quite a lot of people do not have. Pay for the firefighters, pay for the infrastructure you have, roads and things like that. But at the time, the whole primary function of uh, taxation and tolls was to provide revenue. It is very instructive to draw a comparison between the toll system in England, France and Germany more than in any other sphere. England here represented a type clearly distinguishable from that of other countries. While on the other hand, conditions in France and Germany were largely similar at the beginning of the Middle Ages. Difference in the latter, development of both countries can therefore, to some extent, supply a standard for comparing the effectiveness of mercantilism. In the one case under the most favorable, and in the other case under the least favorable political conditions. Okay. England. Now an actual example. Let's see. Let's see how interesting quote-unquote interest in it is you know on their country was the task of establishing a uniform toll system relatively so easy in england yes Hmm. Okay. Just need to do some side things over here that I need to write. And uh, I occasionally get a little bit distracted from reading. Sorry about that. You know, their country was a task of establishing a uniform toll system relatively so easy as in England. And two factors were in the main responsible for this. The first, as in all other spheres, was the united and unbroken strength of the English monarchy. And the second was the overwhelming importance of sea transport, making land, routes and inland waterways far less important than was the case in such compact geographical blocks as Germany and France. English development cannot be explained without taking both of these influences into consideration. The taxes on internal trade were not lacking. There were, in fact, two groups of subchances such taxes, road, bridge, and river tolls, on the one hand, and on the other, town tolls, and each of the two groups had an entirely different development and outcome. Road and river tolls. As being mentioned, the first of these two groups consisted of road and similar tolls. Those tolls, those tolls, god damn it, I already forgot how to pronounce this. Toll. Do not talk. Do 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 do. In England, their distinguishing feature was the general preservation of the characteristic which in all territories had been the main reason for their origin, namely, a payment for the use of a means of communication, or perhaps more accurately, a compensation for its construction or maintenance, or both. Ah, huh. wait, what? reason for the origin, namely a payment for the use of a means of communication, or perhaps more accurately, a compensation for its construction and maintenance are both. Ah. Such, a function, such a function cannot be fulfilled by a modern custom system. When, as in the Middle Ages, tolls were set up along the roads, it was very easy for them to be used for financing and construction and upkeep of the roads themselves. Yeah, this is how, this is how the tolls over here work. We have the we have the federal roads. Wait, I need to. Yeah, federal roads. We have federal roads, and they have generally a few tolls set along them because they connected the whole state and any maintenance. So there are towns that pay for the for not only for their maintenance but for their construction. 
they like they make a loan some companies make a huge loan they build the road and then they set up a toll there and then they spend years and years and decades gathering money on that road to pay off the investment or something and there is quite a lot of uh, problems going around because of that because uh, I guess people are kind of bad at planning over here because sometimes these invest quite often these investments do not uh, get paid off properly <laughs> so there goes a lot of problems around the money and the tolls and the funding and the upkeep and things like that anyway it's time for an ad break i need my yeah i need to drink more water i need to drink a little bit of water be right back
All right, we're back. I also had to get a uh, hydrate, doggo. Yeah, indeed. I had to hydrate, but I also had to grab something to eat. The only thing I ate today was a bit of coffee. No, not the today, but I mean as a, a snack in the afternoon was coffee and uh, the marshmallow. Let me grab another marshmallow. Actually. So I made myself a quick sandwich. And just uh, some ham and cheese on a simple bread. I'm not thinking about um, getting myself some sauces. Like I have some old sauces there, but they're not really good. Over here we don't have a lot of good sauces, honestly. Our sauces are too simplistic and uh, uninspired. Sauces that we have for sale, though. I can make some good um, barbecue sauce that goes well with... Uh, that goes well with uh, with the sandwich, but the barbecue sauces they sell over here, none of them are good. None of them are really good. They all have too weird of a taste. Not a, not too much of a clear taste. They're just I don't know. Sour, too sour. Yeah, they like to make things too sour, and it's disappointing. But I'm now I'm starting to crave for for sandwiches with sauces. Anyway, anyway, where was I? Reminds me that I need to get hot sauce. Yeah, even hot sauce over here. Or hot sauce, or the most common hot sauce is actually way more sour than actually hot. There's just a, a light, a light heat to it, but it's very sour. So it gives the impression of being hot. For me to get a, a hot sauce, actual hot sauce, uh, there was like only three flasks of it. Well, there's like huge shells full of this bad hot sauce. The actual hot sauce was basically a non non-existent comparison to the the shitty hot sauce. It's incredibly dumb. But I'm not sure. I don't think uh, I don't think at least Brazilians of the south have a taste for hot things. But anyway, where were we? Finishing construction and upkeep of the hurls themselves, and even to this day, the system has not entirely vanished. Oh, yeah. The holes were set up along the roads. It was very easy for them to be used for financing the construction and upkeep of the roads themselves. And even today, the system has not entirely vanished. Indeed, the system is very much alive over here in Brazil. It's me, I'm hot stuff. You definitely are some hot stuff, Penso. You definitely are some hot stuff. Yummy. I need some I need some I need I need a piece of that. Thus, in actual fact, the taxes became a normal price for the use of the means of communication. An amount paid by the users who benefited to cover the cost of production. But in spite of this, a payment for this economic service was much more injurious than prices usually are. For such means of communication can generally bear a much greater volume of traffic than that actually using them. They are intermittent free goods, and if some part of the plantation traffic is driven away through fixing a price for their use, they are prevented from yielding their full service. Even irrespective of this, the method of fixing a price by means of road and bridge tolls... The tolls or tolls again? God damn it, I keep forgetting. So Toll, right? Toll. 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 I keep saying toll. Toll. <clears throat> Even in respect of this, the method of... Where's my mouse? The method of fixing a price by means of road and bridge tolls is particularly obstructive. However, there must have been an enormous difference between such a system and the continental one, where the sole aim of road, bridge and river tolls was to extract as much as possible from the use of the rounds, without the obligation to render any service in return. To all appearances, this difference was due mainly to the strength of the English monarchy. Hmm. We find that in medieval England, the state consistently and to an astonishing degree opposed all attempts to level charges without a quid pro quo of service. Or for an indefinite period. In the year 1219, for instance, I'm gonna eat another marshmallow. Mm. 
The king refused our request to allow a toll to be imposed for improving our own. In many other cases, such requests were simply granted, but always only for a limited period, two, three, or five years, and in one exceptional case, seven years. In fact, it was not rare for permission to be given for a shorter period than it was asked for, and only on condition that the scale of charges was to be conformed to, and with the, ex and with the express understanding that the revenue was to be used only for the agreed purpose. Oh. Mm, this is good. This is this is actual. This is actual modern thinking of using the taxes for an actual purpose rather than just, whoa, well, more money. Got a hoard all the money. With an illustration, how seriously what well, all this was taken was the fact that the inhabitants of a particular locality could ask for auditors to examine the accounts relating to the use of the new revenue. If this stipulated improvement had not taken place, and that such an investigation could also be ordered. An inconceivable measure on the continent. It is only natural that abuses of the tall privilege, tall privileges were not entirely lacking. But the meager results of repeated investigations of this kind seem to indicate that, from the beginning, they generally had the desired effect. No less illustrative was the fact that in the petitions in which permission was sought to level tolls, the reason stated was always the damage caused by the condition of the existing road or bridge, and never the need for revenue on the part of the particular owner. Ah. 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 Let's see. There's no very firm permission to give for a short period. What we're to do, and we just press on the two. We did only for the great purpose. Contacts on. England and Gaul. This is important because it, it shows an understanding. It shows a uh, a, a beneficial system in place. In addition to this kind of toll, use as payment for service rendered. Legally termed those thorough, there were, of course, others based on the rights of private property and completely at the disposal of the owners, though traverse, or on privileges and ancient traditions. And then, since you have been the case, particularly with the river tolls, for which in the majority of instances no quid pro quo was made. That's awesome. Hmm. Based on the ranks of private property, okay, yeah, this is the quote. Oh shit, I didn't copy. No quid pro quo, so they are not rendering tariffs. They are just paying at all because you had to pay at all. You had to pay at all. But it is striking that the few traces of those were left behind in the general development, at least if one reckons by medieval standards. The not infrequent complaints against the hindrance to river traffic when concerned much more frequently with the material obstructions caused by impayments and meals, and with the encroachments of monopolistic shipowners than with the legal tolls. The conclusion that the internal trade in England during the Middle Trade was Middle Ages was to a remarkable extent free from hindrances is also strengthened by the material which the Royal Rogers has collected in his history of agriculture and prices in England. In his comprehensive data on cost of transport, the figures for toll charges rarely occur in the lowness of the freight costs, which he shows in detail with the aid of documents points in the same direction. The various kinds of road charges in existence during the Middle Ages seem to have disappeared except in rare instances. In the course of the following centuries, without leaving any trace to show whether the disappearance was due to interference, later, to be more exact, about 1660, though in general from the middle of the 18th century or onwards, there arose an entirely new situation in the system of road charges, a characteristic feature of English internal trade, to a greater extent than in any continental country. Thus was the rise of the so-called Turnpike Road. 
taking the name from the turnpike or Dunsteel at which the tunnels were connected. Turnpike Road. Hmm. The Hyde Park Gate in London, reacted by the Kensington Turnpike Trust, was the first stall point in country along the Bath Road, only being called. Hmm. Turnpike Trust were bodies set up by individual acts of parliaments with powers to collect the world tolls. Maintaining the principal roads in Britain from the 17th, but especially during the 18th and 19th century. Turnpike Road. 8,000 toll gates and sidebars. Damn, that is a lot. Declining with the coming of the railroads and then the local government. Ah. Can we see a turnpike over here? No, we can't. Is there any cool, is there any nice picture that we can see? The round house, old townhouse. Oh, this is a cute house. Look at look at how cute it is. It looks like a little dick. Jesus Christ, the amount of turnpikes. Holy shit, look at this. These were all the tolls. Like, we have only a few tolls. We can go across the country over here with, uh, with only a few tolls. You don't have thousands upon thousands of tolls in Brazil. This is insane. Can I get more pictures of it? More paintings of it, I guess. Turnpike Trust. No, they're just only these two paintings, I guess. Or this one. Yeah, it doesn't show much, though. Whatever. Taking the name from the turnpike or turn steel at which the tolls were collected. And they eventually formed the fifth and by far the best fifth of the network of roads in England. The system with the users paying tolls to private corporations. The turnpike trust as they were called, created by acts of parliament, brought about a thorough reform in the hitherto unusually bad road system. Daniel Defoe and Optimist in matters of economic progress devotes a really lyrical description to the system in his account of England in the 1720s. He gives the following picture. The benefit of these turnpikes appears now to be to be so great and a pit with no places being to be so simple of it that it is incredible what effect it has already had upon trade in the countries where it is more completely finished. The turnpike trusts could not of course, overcome the fundamental weakness of this method of fixing prices for the users of the roads, and an added confusion of roads as a result of the absence of any system in dividing up the roads among the various trusts. The expensive and inefficient administration, and not infrequently, the actual abuses. They existed long enough to become the cause as late as the beginning of the 1840s of the, Rebe of the Rebecca Riot. Rebecca Riot. Several parts of Ailes, including they were a series of protests made by tunnel farmers against the payment of tolls charged to use the road. Response to levels of taxation. The rioters often ran dressed as women, took their actions against toll gates as they were tangible. Re often men dressed as women, <laughs> as their tangible representation of taxes and tolls. The rioters went by the name of Merch Becca. It translated directly from Welton's, Rebecca's daughter. From the increased troop levels, a desire by the protesters to avoid violence, the appearance of criminal groups is in the guise of the biblical character Rebecca. Mend the laws between two parents. Oh. Oh, because they're in dire poverty.
Yeah, they are just generally in shit over there. And because they were in shit, they could not pay the toll, so they protested. That was the lump. Hmm. Oh, yeah, green harvest will have supported by sheep and but this is it's one where the price of their corn with the weather's forever was very low. The farmers were faced with drastic reduction in their income but had no financial relief in similar reductions in their outgoings, mainly rents, tithes, county rates, poor rates, and turnpike tolls. Farm rents were mainly static, but the tithes, tolls, and poor rates increased. Like themselves as victims of tyranny and oppression, farmers and the workers took the law into their own hands to rid themselves of these taxes. First institutions to be attacked were the hated toll gate. Ooh. Mm, why did they actually drive themselves as women? That's what I'm searching for. Mobs dressed in the guise of Rebecca. The game known as Marriage Becca. The origin of the name is to be in the verse of Bible Genesis. And they blessed Rebecca and said unto her, and told her to assist her without the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. It was shot many times by a religious downfall. Rebecca would call to his followers, were also dressed as women, and perform a scene which involved the following words. So it was the <laughs> they were making a performance. They were making they were making a fucking performance, a theatrical performance during the poor protest. This is weird but also cool. And even towards the end of the century, there were 160 of them in the neighborhood of London alone. In spite of all this, they gave England for the first time so good and orderly a system of rules that in France which is ahead of her time in matters of rules, they were cause for admiration. And apart from the cultural development, which spread with increase of post chases, they were certainly indispensable as the basis for the Industrial Revolution. Undoubtedly, an enormous difference existed between this highly commercialized road system and the feudal system of road and river tolls on the continent. Hmm. Town dues. Freedom from local municipal tolls in England was not so prevalent as freedom from road, bridge, and river toll, and thus is highly indicative of the comparative strength of feudal as against municipal disintegration. The state was generally powerful enough to check the expression of purely private design, but the bow the important matters before the policy of the cities. The state was generally powerful enough to check the expression of purely private desires, but about the important matters, matters before the policy of the cities. Okay, so the, the state could uh, could stop individuals, private individuals, from getting from uh, running loose with the laws, but the state still could not go against what the cities want, what the people of the cities want. To some extent, the town dues were also in the nature of payments for certain special service rendered by the town. As for instance, moorage for the improvement of the walls, voyage for keeping the quays in good condition, pavage for the paving of the streets, and so on. So basically, local taxes. Nor did the state fail to interfere if these revenues were not applied to the, to the ends for which they were raised. The difference between the town charges and the road tolls was that the former were paid by traders, who often gained little or nothing from the service of the town to which the money went. Charges even for this kind, when the state, in various cases, authorized them, became a kind of tax on trade for commercial and municipal purposes, or for the general needs of the country. Hmm. And the road toll was the former were paid by traders. It does make sense. The traders are paying taxes on things that they do not use. They're paying taxes on things they do not use. Kind of tax on trade for commercial and municipal purposes. Or for the general needs of the country. Taxing on, the taxing of trade for local needs was, however, 
much more remarkable in the large number of cases where the Jews found their way directly into the coffers of the town or were used for purposes entirely connected with trade and navigation. In this form, there existed a varied collection of Jews in English towns, not only in the corporate but also in other towns, principally those on the coast but also upcountry towns, especially in connection with markets and fairs. The system, if we can't call it a system, showed no tendency to disappear towards the end of the Middle Ages, as was the case with the road and the river tolls. Of course, many of the towns and market tolls gradually lapsed, but others grew up instead as large sources of revenue, especially in towns such as London and Liverpool. They were the cause of serious protests in Parliament as late as 1830, especially as their legality was not beyond reproach. In London, the examples of them 20 years later too, and in other places even as late as the later part of the 19th century. In other cases, as for instance in Hull, the tolls were expressly sanctioned by Acts of Parliament. The tolls form a portion of the rights pertaining to the members of the privileged municipal corporations, the so-called premier or borgeses, possess civic rights and in whose hands lay the administration of the town. And so these people were generally exempt from the tolls in their own city. The exemption which the burgesses of one city enjoyed was frequently extended to include the towns of other cities and in some cases even the local towns of the whole country, thus obviously limiting to an appreciable extent the obstructive effects of local towns. But on the other hand, they formed a new hindrance to trade in that they lacked consistency and were quite arbitrary in their treatment, not only of the burgesses of different towns but also in particular of inhabitants as opposed to freemen within the same town. I can imagine the fucking nightmare. In one town you pay, in one town you pay taxes. In one, in another town you do not pay taxes. You, the taxes are also all random and for random purposes, and uh, for you may not even feel the purposes itself. It it sounds like fucking chaos. It's all it's all about administration. It is all about administration. The town tolls did not, however, create an obstruction comparable with that of the feudal rural toll regime. Moreover, the importance was limited by the fact that every city had to consider the possibility that trade and commerce by land or sea would seek other rounds, that is, it was limited by peculiar geographical position of England. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. So while it was chaos, they could, other, they could never really, really abuse these taxes because there are taxes on trade, and if you abuse the taxes on trade, your trade dries up and you're fucked. Nevertheless, they represented in all cases the only enduring element of medieval town confusion in English commerce. It was the influence of town policy breaking through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like he said, it was the power of the, the towns had enough power that they could just levy these towers. They could just, they, they could just force people to pay these taxes. Not a lot of taxes, a legal taxes, but they had the power to do it because the state could not actually stop them in any significant way. At least for for the for the for the time period. Uniform national custom system. Uniformity of the English custom system was not manifest not merely in the fact that forces leading to disintegration were absent or of minor importance, but also in a positive way. England occupied a new position not only to the insignificance of her road and river tolls, but was also able to evolve a national custom system, entirely independent of the municipal tolls and completely in the hands of the state, customs being neither fired out nor modified by numerous examples. It may be typified by the fact that tolls relating to foreign trade were separated from all other tolls and are subjected by the state to uniform treatment. Yeah, uniform treatment is the, is the important thing over here because the common factor of all these of all these taxation problems was that they created chaos. <laughs> they created chaos and another and they created more 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 barriers towards trade. And with more barriers towards trade, there's always more there's always more wealth moving around and less developed and then uh, and uh, how do you say it? Even blank. My mind went blank. Jesus Christ! My mind went blank. I had one more thing to say. More barriers to trade, less development, and less wealth, less luxuries. 
luxuries. Lens. Lens. Ah, my mind is dying over here. Fuck. I want to make this point. I want to finish this point. Barriers to trade mean less luxuries. Mean less intercommunication. Because communication is also part of the trade. Letters and other things. They, you, need a, you need a good trading system to make this... Uh, make it work to send letters to make communications which made uh government central government more difficult to maintain because without this communication being more free and available you would have difficulties uh getting information from distant places and also sending orders and keeping those places under control there's a whole lot of, uh, there's a whole lot of, uh, actors that, uh... That uh, fuck with the, the fuck with the state without open trade. Open, standardized, and uniform trade. Yeah, I'm starting to get too tired to make points. Ah! My mind is dying. My mind is dying. My mind, the, the, the information are there in my mind. But it's hard to make a, it's getting hard to make a, a coherent sentence unifying them all together. I kind of get, I understand what I want to say, but it's hard to organize it in a, in a sensical way. Anyway, I think I could make some quotes over here. Maybe make some highlights, honestly. These are interesting. Ah, I should be making. Mm -hmm. Okay, not here. This paragraph already me. Americans are wrong. Who charges? Mm -hmm. That was the right. Oops, sorry. That was a loud yawn. I guess I can make this because turnpikes were important. Turnpikes were important. Well, I should not apologize for yawns. <laughs> 153 times. I should not apologize for yawn. I could I say you're welcome for yawning. You're welcome for this yawn. These are two quotes that I'm keeping it close together. Mm. If can do freedom from law communication was not so present as freedom from the law. State. This is an interesting quote. The state still bowed before a policy of the cities. Mm. There's one. It was taxes the taxes were for services but the services were not related to the traders to the people being taxed people being taxed do not benefit from the from the taxes themselves tomorrow I the system show no tendency The example on which no no not going to be mm. 
create an abstract compared to the penal tone. Oh, we're the importance. Yeah, this one. The importance of the the taxes was limited because there are taxes on economy. So you can't exactly push too far with these with these taxes or else or else your country goes to shit. Now national custom system. I think uh, the good sense being I don't know, maybe time to find by the planet dolls. Well, the other towns and were subjected by the state to uniform treatment. For this national system of duties imposed upon foreign trade, the word customs came okay, should be used in England. So, being written for duties upon inland trade, the autonic languages on the continent had only one word for both. Already at so early a period was the reign of June, blah blah blah, one of his natural customs, such as for instance, you want blah 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 blah. Yet under the three of vendors, blah 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 blah. It's just a timeology over here. It occurred at a time for which the available facts are too few to warrant on opinions to the way in which it was brought about, but the fact that it occurred it at all is remarkable enough in itself. Oh my god. Useless sentence, useless phrase. It was moreover this that not only were the customs in the hands of the state, but they showed the precocious distinctions between foreign and domestic trade. We find mention as early as the first half of the 12th century. This is actually interesting because it was the first time that uh, in, that uh, local and international, domestic and international policy was making was having a difference and, but it showed a precocious distinction between foreign and domestic well not the first time but it was a uh, it was an it was an interesting characteristic enough for the writer to talk about it so i'm gonna quote it this well sent you a list of privileged gentlemen to newcastle and right to export green from the mother country exception which was at the time completely unknown continental economic policy Similar to the Winchester size of 1203, you are very careful to distinguish between the transport of goods from one place to another within the country and the export from one country to another. In the system, the authority of the state in English economic affairs created a monument which was destined to endure. Establish a custom system which did not have to rely on the existing local social organization was to surpass the attempts, let alone the achievements, even in the Carolingian monarchy. The remarkable thing here was to run the ancient regime, not so much it itself as the ability to execute it. Oh. The remarkable thing here is not the idea, but the ability to execute it. In other words, the fact that the central authority possessed the organization for starting the system and keeping it functioning. But still, it was hardly possible immediately to construct in England a complete national customs unity. If, by the term England, we understand the territory taken as a whole, ruled by the king, Sir William Petty, in every respect one of the most prominent of mercantilist writers, dealt with the lack of informity, uniformity in England, English administration is political arithmetic. In a separate chart or title, but the impediments of England's greatness are but contingent and removable. In particular, he attacked the customs barriers by which England, Scotland, and Ireland hither in trade with each other, and the fact that they regarded each other not merely as foreign countries but, at times, as actual enemies. Petty was also concerned with the treatment given to the colonies. Hmm. This is an interesting quote. The, the beginnings of free trade, free trade agreements. Someone's in, someone's, uh, he's actually encouraged free training agreements. But he was also concerned with the treatment given to the colonies. In another contemporary work, pointed out the peculiar position of the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man. It was a considerable time before these hindrances to trade within the British Empire were to be finally overcome. In many ways, they had never been overcome at all. What is Isle of Man? Let me check something. It is a peculiar name. What the fuck is that banner? No, 
Oh, it's in between Ireland. It's over here. Middle point. A curious little place. Wait. Oh, I already closed it. We can't actually open it again. It was a considerable time before these hindrances to trade within the British Empire, which have been finally overcome. In many ways, they had never been overcome at all. The customs barriers between England and Scotland were the first to disappear, thanks to his origin. James I was already awake to the significance of the problem. And, Another yawn, you're welcome. In 1607, the king in parliament pointed out how much more it would profit the whole kingdom to remove the customs barriers than it would cause loss to individual merchants. A kind of customs freedom was practiced for a few years but no longer. The act of union brought about the final change and complete freedom in trade, communication and shipping was established. In this connection we may add as a curious exception to the general rule that even after this date, there remain a small formal remnant of medieval conditions. The boundary in town, Berwick on Tweed, which previously belonged sometimes to one country and sometimes to the other, but in 1482 definitely became English, had to be mentioned explicitly until <laughs> 1747 in the English statute book, so as to make the statute applicable to the town. The same applies to Wales. <laughs> they had to fucking mention a, a, a city in specific just so the rules actually apply to it. The Isle of Man, Isle of Man was a fief separated from the English crown for the time of Henry IV, that is from the beginning of the 15th century. But when in 1765 it was eventually bought back, it was not automatically incorporated within the English customs territory, but obtained a complicated position of its own. Measures were taken against the flourishing smuggling trade between the islands and the mainland. Customs administration was transferred to the mainland. And at the same time, the little island received the right to export fully to Great Britain such, such products as could by extremely detailed declarations of... <laughs> The little island received the right to export freely to Great Britain such products as could, by extremely de detailed declarations of origin, be proved to have been made from native raw materials, as well as flax and hemp. <laughs> yeah, even in medieval times, the weird... No, in medieval times, this weird... These weird uh, economic rules became even more disruptive. Because of how awkward the bureaucracy of the time would be to maintain the customs autonomy thus establish holds good on the whole, even at the present day. Customs autonomy thus establish holds good on the whole, even at the present day. Jesus, hundreds of years with the same antiquated laws that they, that they tell you in extremely, extremely specific detail. The describing is extremely specific detail. Channel Islands even today are not included in England for purpose of customs duties and taxations and in general they are the best example of the persistence of feudal conditions within the British Empire. What the? I got a... Uh, I got a fucking message on my WhatsApp for internet even though my internet's already good. Fuck those things. The relationship with Ireland and the other colonies was, however, of much more practical importance. Ireland's position was peculiar insofar as her separation from England was not medieval in origin. On the contrary, English legislation of the 17th and 15th centuries put Irish goods throughout on the same footing as English. Not until the restoration did any change take place. Ireland was then, for the first time, treated as a foreign country for the purpose of custom duties. This is uninteresting. The 
took hundreds of years to fiscally unite the British Islands. Islands. It took hundreds of years. 1660? 1660? 1800s. Like 200, 200 years almost. No, 140 years, but still, that's a shit long time to unite fiscally the countries. <laughs> that is low as fuck. The colonies themselves stood in a peculiar relationship to the mother country, which grew out of the so called old colonial system. The view that the colonies were treated as a special complement to the mother country led inevitably to special treatment of them and the customs barriers which the mother country set up were not removed until free trade triumphed in England. Triumphed in England. Although set up by the colonies, still existed and are becoming more and more widespread. Okay. Last section, I guess, results. The remains in England of the disintegrated custom systems are interesting as evident of the difficulties encountered even under the most favorable political conditions in this surmounting of medieval conditions. But on the whole, the result was fairly uniform and complete. Britain was one of the few other countries which could boast of an even more complete customs unity. In Adam Smith, we have an impartial and well-informed witness in support of thorough uniformity in England, especially compared with the continent. His great work is, in all other respects, a skating criticism. Criticism, throughout of English mercantilism in particular, and of the ancient regime of this on its economic side in general. He appears particularly reliable when his judgment happens to be favorable, especially as his positions of Commissioner of Customs in Scotland allow him ample opportunity of intimate acquaintance with customs administration. Uh, Adam Smith's judgment on customs condition in England, followed by his criticisms of corresponding conditions in France, and advice on reforming the later on English lines, thus forms an appropriate ending to the foregoing description. It reads. The Elan trade is almost perfectly free. The greater part of goods may be carried from one end of the kingdom to the other, without requiring any permit or let pass, without being subject to question, visit or examination from the revenue officer. There are a few exceptions, but there are such as can give no interruptions to any important branch of England, commerce of the country, inland commerce of the country. Goods carried coastwise indeed require certificates or coast cockets. If you accept coals, however, the rest are almost all duty free. The freedom of interior commerce, the effect of uniformity of the system of taxation, perhaps one of the principal causes of the prosperity of Great Britain. Every great country being necessarily the best and most extensive market for the greater part of the production of its own industry. The same freedom, in consequence of the same uniformity, could be extended to Ireland and plantations, both the grandeur of the state and the prosperity of every part of the empire would probably still would probably be still greater than at present. This is glowing praise towards free trade. The glorious consequences of free trade. I think this is the quote. Read on interior, the French of Canada is perhaps one of the greatest prosperity. Every great country being necessarily the best and most extensive market for the greater part of the production of its own industry. So if the greatest the greatest market for the local products is the country itself, doesn't it make sense you want trade to flow freely, so the market grows. It does make sense. Can I quote something before then? This is a lot of... Uh... I, could, I wanted to quote this because it took hundreds of years. Fiscally, finally, I kind of wanted to quote this, but it's not very important, not very significant of a quote. And just to say that it took hundreds of years to unify customs. 
Okay, I can I guess I can put it on a on the two them. I guess I can add a note. Open paragraph after hundreds of years. This is how long it takes to unify things. Okay, five minutes actually. We just have five minutes. How much is this section? Could we even begin the next one? If just five minutes on for three man. I think I just I'm gonna end it here, honestly. My throat is tired. I'm tired of talking. How many words did you read? We tar we started a um... We started at 37, we ended at 52. 53. 54. Yeah, we started at 37 and ended at 56. How much that is? That is 19 pages. Today we read 19 pages out of 497. Amazing progress! Amazing progress. How much streams is it gonna take? 19 pages. Uh, 497 divided by 19. It's gonna... Calculator, please. Google did not give me the, the actual number. 497 divided by 19. 26 streams. It's gonna take 26 streams to finish this book. Am I actually gonna finish this book? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I think I'm gonna read the sections. Like uh, again, let's take a look at the sections. Where are the sections? Where are the sections? Are there any interesting sections in this? Volume 1, blah blah blah, blah blah blah. Where's the, where's this? Where's the index? Index, please. Index, please. God damn it. Contents, yes. Introduction, historical background. Did it. Fuck! For some reason, if I click on this, I stick me to the chapter, but okay. Disintegration of the tall system in the efforts to overcome the confusion. England, Germany, France. Hmm. We can skip. We could possibly skip this since we already read the thing on England. Results: enormous mobility. Summary: Person with Germany. Oh, this, this, there's, there's, there, there, is, there is information. There is interesting information. I just need to read faster and push through the things that are not important. The struggle against local disintegration in other cities. I'm slowly in understanding more about this book. The longer I go, the more I slowly understand about it. So, not bad. It is not a bad thing to read. From municipal to national policy. Fuck. The gills, the atmosphere machinery of the state. I see. I see. I see. I see interesting. I see interesting titles everywhere I look. My god, there's so much stuff. No, I'm now I'm on losing. I have no idea if it is actually interesting with you. We're in trade and business organization. The executors of mercantilism. Fuck me. Hmm. This is already giving me a lot of ideas and understanding. So I'm slowly, slowly like uh, on this stream, on this stream, I finally understood the, what it actually means. What it actually means. Uh, where is it? The disintegration of... No. Field of disintegration, field of disintegration, particularism, 
I actually finally understood this. I was not exactly getting this last stream, but now I do. Now that I read about it, I, fin I finally get it. So there is a lot of information that I also got here on this. Especially this. Some, uh, some historical knowledge too that's interesting and important. So I feel so sad. I feel so hesitant to just abandon this, but... 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 It's gonna be such a massive pain in the ass, oh my god. I'll just continue on. I'll just continue on until I get bored of this book, I guess. Or I could just switch up between books. Get uh, interesting books. I kind of want to study some things like philosophy, maybe religion. Yeah, religion. I need a book on religion, honestly. I need to study a book on religion. I'm atheist, so... I'm not the best people to understand religion. <laughs> I, need, I need to actually understand the... the how to make an interesting religion. We need to look about books about it. Now, let's just read someone, honestly. Let's just read someone. Ria is playing Killer7. PG. Very long. It's been a while since I... Or maybe I can just uh, read Geotara. Hmm, Nemo. Oh, Nemo is playing Final Fantasy, but they've been online for a while. Oh, Dai is playing Mahjong. Oh god, I'm not gonna raid him. Play Mahjong. Hmm. There's someone new playing Retro. It's always a, it's always a different point, different, difficult question. Who do you raid? Who do you raid? I don't think I have a lot of time though. I'm just gonna raid uh, Gyotara. I got stuff to do now. I got stuff. He's doing deep rock, so. Rock and stone, brothers. Rock and stone. Here's the raid message. Let's see. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, I mean, this, uh, tomorrow's gonna be a Lude art stream. Lude AI art stream. And I'm undecided whether or not I uh, do. Do it on Pomf. Or if I go for Picarto. If I do it on Pomf, I can do Lolly stuff one day. Picarto will not accept me doing uh, Lolly AI art, lewd Lolly AI art, so I think I might as well just stay on Pomf anyway. Not like I'm gonna do any near, near anytime soon, but it feels like it's a more welcoming place. Picarto. Yeah, Picarto is weird. <laughs> As a streaming service, because I obviously can't stream that on Twitch. And I also obviously not gonna be able to upload on Sensory on YouTube anyway. Picarto also doesn't have VODs. Picarto doesn't save VODs. It's just a streaming service. You can't save VODs unless you're a uh, subscriber. Premium user. And then you individually save the VODs, not the, not the streamer save the VODs. So, no much point in it. So, I think I'll just team on, stream on Pomf anyway tomorrow. And Saturday, Giant Citizen Kabuto, Kabuto, Night, the funny, the funny shooter game with the wacky humor, nonsensical humor. And then Sunday, Sunday is Lucky Sunday. So same time as this one, Sunday. I'm gonna be playing Longers. What's the name of that game? That game has a, such a long ass game, long ass name. Lovers in a dangerous space time. Jesus Christ. But that's pretty much it. Thank you for joining. Thank you for liking. Thank you for appearing in those nerdy sessions. I'm gonna. Gonna raid. Is he actually off his uh, opening Zoom stream? Whatever. He's on, he's on his opening Zoom stream, but I don't care. Take care of your wife, please. take care of your husband, those. I'll see you all next time. Bye bye. There you go, he's playing Blasphemous. Ooh, cool.